Hello, my name is Thomas and welcome to British Culture, Albion Never Dies. Today I'm talking about the 1964 movie Zulu and the real Battle of Rorke's Drift on which the movie was based. I asked my friends on Instagram, have you seen Zulu? And 63% of people said yes, but 37% said no. I imagine this could be because a lot of my friends on Instagram, like my listeners uh, here on my podcast, are based outside the UK. It could also be a reflection of the varied age of listeners. It is an old film. I guess a lot of younger people haven't seen it. Then again, I've seen it. So I'm going to talk about the movie, but without giving any major spoilers. I'm going to talk about the history, the significance of it, and I'm also going to talk about the answers to my question in a Facebook group called The Gentleman's Society for the Appreciation of the British Empire. This is a Facebook group with around 27,000 members, and I asked them, what fact about the Battle of Rock's Drift do you wish more people would know? And there are well over 300 comments, around 400 reactions. I asked this on October the 13th, and I'm still getting answers now. So I'm going to go through all of those comments um, feeding back uh, to you, I think the most interesting ones, the ones that give the most insight into the real history. So, as part of that discussion, there were two published authors who contacted me, Neil Thornton, who wrote Rock's Drift, A New Perspective, and Kevin Brazier, uh, who wrote Victoria Crosses of the Zulu and Boer Wars. So, Perhaps you can check out those two authors. Um, as I put this together, I was already looking at three pretty solid books. Once again, I'm using the kind of the general, reliable, very solid book, The Rise and Fall of the British Empire by Lawrence James, to give a bit of context. For a bit of whimsy, I was looking at Pax Britannica by uh, James or Jan Morris. And uh, for a deep dive into the Zulu War, I looked at Rourke's Drift by Adrian Greaves, which covers not just the battle, but goes deep into Zulu culture, Boer culture, and so on. And of course, the essential viewing is Zulu, but you can listen to this podcast after watching the film or before. And as I said, I've been helped enormously by the comment commentators, commenters uh, in the Gentleman's Facebook group, of course. I'll use family names only, as not everyone wishes to be named in a podcast and, and hunted down <laughs> you can join the the group yourself and then reach out to whoever you want to so as i say i first had a look at the lawrence james book on the british empire and he commented uh, towards the end of the book on um movies and popular culture about the empire touching on zulu he wrote this paragraph about it quote zulu is perhaps the most spectacular and accomplished of all imperial films. It tells the story of a, quote, glorious, unquote, episode of imperial history, the defence of Rourke's Drift during the Zulu War. But the theme is the grit shown by ordinary men in extraordinary circumstances. The battle is stripped of its romance, and the audience watches the collision between brave men, black and white, who are thrown against each other for reasons neither attempts to understand. The mood is fatalistic. We are here because there's no one else, comments the colour sergeant. He fights like everyone else to save the lives of his comrades. No one mentions queen or country. Just from that one paragraph, I had five questions. One, what is Rourke's Drift? Two, who are the Zulis? Three, why did we have a war? Four, why is the battle so famous? And five, what's so special about the film? So, I'll work through them. Uh, the first question, what is Rourke's Drift? It's a river crossing, uh, you know, the drift of the river. It's in southern Africa, now in South Africa. Uh, the closest town is uh, Newcastle, South Africa. It's one of the few crossing points on the Buffalo River, which at the time of the battle... 1879, it formed the border between Zululand and British-controlled Natal. It was a, a river crossing safe for wagons. That was its significance, one of a very small number of good crossing points. It had been settled by James Rourke, who set up a supply shop there in 1849. What I find interesting is the Zulu name for Rourke's Drift. They called it Kwajimu. Kwa, meaning of, and Jimu, 
meaning Jimmy. They called it Jimmy's Place after the same James Rourke, who we named it after. So both combatants knew it after James Rourke. He had passed away in 1875, his impoverished wife selling the property to the Swedish missionary Otto Witt, who is portrayed in the movie. So I find that interesting. Both of them described the place, you know, naming it after the same man. My second question was, who are the Zulus? For this, I was really looking at the book by Adrian Greaves called Rogue's Drift. Flicking through it, he, the second chapter is on the Zulu's history, and I found it engrossing. It was very, very new to me. He said, like the British soldiers, the Zulus had also originally invaded southern Africa. Over several thousand years, the Bantu-speaking people spread laterally across Central Africa from the equatorial west coast and slowly progressed south and east. This is a migration of between four to four and a half thousand miles, or seven thousand kilometers, depending which, which measurement they use. The Zulus had spread, uh, according to his book, into the territory uh, the 19th century Brits considered Zululand under Shaka Zulu in the early 1800s in a series of conflicts roughly contemporaneous with the Napoleonic Wars. As Napoleon swept across Europe, Shaka Zulu swept into what we would then consider Zululand. Carrying on with Shaka Zulu, Shaka's rule was total until 1827 when his mother, Nandi, suddenly died. It is said that Shaka's grief was so intense that he required every Zulu to experience his loss. Had a gathering of some 20,000 souls within the homestead, enforced wailing and summary executions commenced and continued for more than a day until 1,000 of the multitude lay dead. Shaka then decreed that during the next 12 months no crops could be grown. Children were not to be conceived or milk drunk all on pain of death. The situation continued for three months until Shaka tired of mourning, whereupon normality returned. I'm sure you can imagine that such circumstances were not entirely popular. Shaka was assassinated by his half-brothers as soon as the Zulu army was away on campaign. Now I'm going to skip some of their internal struggles here that brought Mpande to power and their early encounters with the Boer settlements as both the Boer territory, the, the Dutch settlers in South Africa, and the Zulu territories expanded to meet each other and indeed with a much smaller but perhaps more influential British territory also in the mix. Mpande had two sons, Kachweo, older and very warlike, and Mbul Mbulazi, the second son, and generally thought to be much more scholarly. Please forgive my pronunciation of any names. This is all relatively new to me. I've been looking into it as prompted uh, by people suggesting this in the comments and people requesting me to cover this topic. So I've been learning a great deal over the last week or two. By 1856, the stage was set for a new power struggle between these two men. I'm going to carry on again drawing heavily on Adrian Greaves' book, which I'm thoroughly enjoying. As usual, resolution came through bloody conflict, perhaps the worst seen or recorded in African history. Near Ndondakusuka Hill, Kachweo mustered 20,000 warriors, the Usutu, and pitted them against Mbulazi's army of 30,000, the Izi Gakuza, which included many women and old men. The confrontation took place on the banks of an insignificant stream, the Tambo, which fed into the Tugela River. The battle lasted no more than an hour, with Umbulazi's army being heavily defeated. In customary Zulu fashion, Quechueo gave orders for their total slaughter, and only a handful of survivors escaped. Quechueo was later song praised for his victory, as being the victor who caused people to swim against their will, for he made men swim when they were old. Kachweo, of course, was the king at the time of the Battle of Rourke's Drift. He was successful in war and brutal, as his culture and traditions demanded. Their empire was expanding to meet the Boers, and the Boers were the Protestant Dutch settlers who'd arrived in what is now South Africa after the establishment of the Dutch East India Company in 1602. 
they established what is now Cape Town in around 16. 16- 52. And by the late 19th century, the Boers' towns were established and their rural homesteads were spreading out as they sought new territories to the north. So what we see are the Zulu Empire expanding, the Boer Empire expanding, and of course, ourselves, the Brits. So why did we have a war? Again, if you feel some of these history books that I've mentioned give a very, very good account, and rather than read it out or account it as it may be familiar to some, I'm just going to say with such unstoppable forces, three expanding empires, a collision was surely inevitable at some point. So, why was the Battle of Rourke's Drift so famous? Well, for one thing, it's the largest number of Victoria Crosses awarded in one battle. That is, of course, the highest award possible to give in the British Army for courage and bravery and so on. It could be famous because it's such an outstanding example of a small defending force holding out against a much, much larger attacking force. It could also be that this is renowned because it was so well publicised the local British leaders desperate to promote this, to cover for their own blunders, both in the lead-up to the war and in the initial phases of the war. But really, to go into why is the battle so famous, I want to check in on the comments. As I said, there's over 300 comments in this Facebook group, and you can see them for yourself. Uh, You can become the 27,000th and first person to join, but I have gone through all of them. I'd like to thank everybody who responded to my short question with so many facts, who responded sometimes with questions of their own, and other people joined to answer those further questions. Yes, even the humorists. Uh, it was a long comment thread and a very, very, very good-natured one. You know, you ask a question on the internet, the great wild internet, you never know what you're going to get. So I'd just like to say thank you to everybody for all of your comments. So, again, I'm slightly anonymizing them. I want to give recognition to the gentleman who who contributed so much to the discussion, but I also realize that not everyone wants to put their name out there. So uh, Mr. By was the first in with Not a Welsh Regiment, because, of course, the film, for those who haven't seen it, does emphasize the Welsh identity of many of the soldiers. Uh, A gentleman responded, Most of the soldiers in the then Warwickshire Regiment were Welsh, later incorporated in the South Wales borders at Brecon, South Wales. So this is something about the British Army regiments, which, of course, have changed, have merged, and especially throughout the 19th century were being reformed and re-reformed. So there was a big question about the the actual identity, and this is something that has come up. The next commenter, Mr Grant, was saying apparently very few were actually Welsh. I wondered about this because, of course, I've uh, worked in many multinational offices, very diverse offices. I remember working in one office where... At one point, there's just one American, uh, and he was from the South, and, and he loved watching Ole Miss uh, play American football, or just football as far as he was concerned. Um, and it's funny, you just had one person there, but he was so keen to teach us, and he was so proud of where he was from. I feel we all picked up uh, a certain a certain love for Ole Miss, and so we all wa- sat around watching uh, you know, Ole Miss play uh, play American football and so on. And you just took one person who's really keen to promote it. Um, and the next couple of Americans, we had one American come in who, yeah, he'd followed American football and he lived in America, but we were all working in China. And so he'd kind of dropped off his interest. But once he got into it, he was like, I don't know why all these Brits are following this. Why, why, why are you all so interested in all this? It was kind of a, a legacy after the Southern gentleman had left. Uh, but it stayed with us. It's funny, sometimes you get these influences. So how Welsh does a Welsh regiment rarely need to be? How many Welshmen does it take? to make everyone just interested in Welsh culture. I'm very curious. As I say, it's very prominent in the in the movie, although in the movie not everyone is Welsh. One of them, Private Hook, is clearly not, and he's kind of the, the antagonist of the film. Again, not giving away too much for those who haven't seen it, uh, but you need someone to be the antagonist, and it's not, the Zulus are not the bad guy. Um, it's Private Hook who, uh, who takes who's the, like, the lightning rod for all the negativity going on. And somebody commented that he wasn't really a barrack room lawyer. I like that phrase. Um, and again, more people contributed to the discussion. He worked in the British Museum. He became a major. His family were very, very angry at the way he was portrayed in the movie. Um, 
one person saying it makes a person wonder why they would portray someone like Hook. Um, you know, there's so many men. Any of them could potentially could potentially have been the antagonist. Um, but apparently, <laughs> he was a very, very good God-fearing teetotaler. Again, more people commented as I go through the comments that the uh, the people at Rock's Drift were not all Welsh. Um, and someone else commented that actually quite a lot enlisted, I think most enlisted in Wrexham in North Wales. And yet, someone else comments, but many, many more of them were Englishmen. Um, <laughs> one chap saying, I'm just, just amazed they managed to get it all on video. And one that really captured my interest, Colour Sergeant Bourne wasn't tall. Uh, apparently he was quite small and thin. He used to read letters for the soldiers who couldn't read and also replied for them. And uh, a Mr. De Silva adds in that he was the youngest colour sergeant in the British Army, um, not the kind of the imposing older father figure portrayed by Nigel Green, a uh, face familiar perhaps if you've seen the movie The Ipcris File. Um, so I found that really interesting. Bourne was only in his mid-twenties. Uh, oh, someone actually gives the height. He was five foot two, aged just 24, the youngest man to hold the rank of colour sergeant in the British Army. He served in World War I and was the last surviving defender at Rolks Drift, dying in 1945, the day after Germany surrendered. So I looked at that and thought, there's, there's a future podcast episode. There's something I feel for all of us to look into. Colour Sergeant Frank... Born. Apparently there's a good video on YouTube from the History Guy about him. And one of the commenters has even visited his grade at Elmer End Cemetery. Uh, there's also a blue plaque for him in Beckenham. Um, his Victoria Cross is at the Imperial War Museum along with Chards, apparently. Um, an amazing collection. A couple of the guys started talking about <laughs> Sir Harry Flashman uh, from the Flashman series of novels. Um, I'm going to leave that uh, for a later point. Um, one fella said, Bromhead, one of the characters portrayed in the movie, was in reality deaf as a post. And that led to a long discussion. Someone saying apparently he was no more deaf than any other infantry of the time. Ear protection was simply not a thing then. Comments source, like wolves on the fold and nothing left but to fight. Um, apparently he was deaf but still had an amazing career in the army and then somebody else says that the reports of him being deaf and possibly a bit stupid come from the months after the battle when he was hounded by the press possibly still in shock and also he might have been created by men who were who were jealous following their vcs and their newfound national popularity hmm. i think this was a long comment thread and, you know, on the internet, everyone's anonymous. I think there was only one lady who commented on all of this. And the lady said, They did not really waste all that time during the battle dealing with a drunk preacher and his bimbo daughter. <laughs> not my words, the words of a lady on the internet. She obviously takes exception uh, to the Swedish girl in the film. <laughs> um, okay, one, one chap says... Uh, we left as soon as he heard they may be coming, no heroics, trying to save the wounded and the waggings. I've got two great books in it, and it doesn't show the lads shooting at Stepson's horse troops as the defenders were shouting rude stuff at them. Um, I asked which books uh, would you would you recommend, and again, I, I saw there those two authors in the group, um, so I was very pleased to hear from them, and those two authors are, of course, Neil Thornton, Rourke's Drift, A New Perspective, and Kevin Brazier, uh, Victoria Crosses of the Zulu and Boa Wars. Both of them uh, available on Kindle. Now, one I thought was really interesting, and it's just a general, general fact about the era, is that s soldiers in the British Army at that time, the late 19th century, were better educated than enlisted men during the First World War. That's because illiterate recruits were taught by the army to read, write, and do maths to an extremely high standard. Historians have compared the literacy in letters written home by soldiers at Rogue's Drift to those of the letters written by men in the trenches. Yeah, the Army Education Corps doing outstanding work. The army had its own schools to help soldiers reach a good enough level to, to make corporal and above. And again, I've already referenced the careers of some of the, some of the soldiers who are in this battle, and you can see... You can see that progress. Um, one gentleman, a Mr. Thompson, 
had visited uh, the battleground at Rourke's Drift and said it's actually relatively small. He Oh, he visited a few years ago. Very surprised, to be honest. There's more discussions over whether the chaps at the battle were Welsh or not Welsh. How Welsh were they? How strong was Welsh identity at the time? Again, it's something I really like about the movie is that it does show strong Welsh identity. There's not many movies that showcase that. Um, and as I travel around the world, you say in Turkey, Middle East, China, um, I meet people who have a very clear idea of, say, Britain as a whole, maybe England, probably Scotland, but very rarely do I come across people who have a very clear idea of Wales and the Welsh um, who are not from the British Isles. Again, reading through the comments on the Facebook group, as I say, there were over 300. Um, someone saying that Private uh, Hook was actually a very honourable soldier, not the malingerer that was portrayed in the film, and his family actually organised a petition to get the film character changed. Um, and a few people commented they don't know if they've heard that, but it is true. Um, that he was a very honourable soldier, maybe it's the rank of full colonel. Hmm... Again, a Mr. De Silva commenting, really interesting, uh, most of the men tore the sleeves off their jackets to wrap around the barrels of their overheating uh, Martini Henrys. That's interesting. And, uh, and a Mr. Clare said that the Major in command left to go get help after putting the engineer in command, and people were arguing back and forth about that, saying that his courage was demonstrated by his efforts to get to Rock's Drift with reinforcements. One chap said that they're more Irish there than Welsh. Um, and you do have a lot of Welsh immigration into Wales at the time. Um, and, and again, this goes back and forth about where were they really from. Um, okay, Mr. Wall saying another great fun fact I found is in the books uh, that Reverend Smith, who isn't shown in the film, when there's a lull in battle and all the lads were shouting obscenities at the Zulus, uh, Mr. Smith asked the lads not to use such terrible language. <laughs> ah, there's a there's a minor role in the film. A commissionary Dalton apparently he played a key role in organising the defence and wasn't defence and he was in fact uh, an experienced uh, soldier. And again, more back and forth. Were they Warwickshire regiment? Were they from a Welsh regiment? Here's a bit more detail on Commissioner Dalton. He wasn't the small, meek man he's portrayed in the film. He's actually a seasoned veteran of large build who was instrumental in convincing Chard and Bromhead to put up a defence rather than try and outrun the Zulus with the sick and wounded in wagons and risk getting caught out in the open. And lots of people are talking about the amazing career of Commissioner Dalton. Again, it's, it's largely what are the Commissioner needs to do with the, the changes in the British Army at the time. A few more people commenting on uh, on Hook, uh, and a few more people commenting on whether they rarely sang Men of Harlech, a, a very Welsh anthem. But actually on the film itself, uh, Mr. Heaton commented that Kane went to audition for the part of Hook, but didn't get it. The director thought he looked posh, and asked if he could talk posh and ride a horse, and Kane said he could until they started filming, and they would have sacked him, but Stanley Baker, uh, who was originally, you know, the real star of it, stuck up for him, and so they used a double for the riding shots and coached his posh accent. Uh, it's all in his autobiography, apparently. His autobiography is really interesting. Of course, Michael Caine spotted his wife in a coffee advert, tracked her down, married her, so on and so on. Is also, as Mr. Anderson pointed out, Michael Caine is, in fact, a combat veteran of the, of the Korean War and in his book he recounts defending a position at night um, when it was attacked in Korea and they let loose with machine guns at dawn expecting to see hundreds of dead Chinese uh, but either they'd all been collected or they never shot any. A bit more on that later. One chap had just asked a question. I say so many, so many really interesting things were being said in the comment group. Um, one chap, Mr. Robbins, asked, is there any memorial of any kind to the Zulu warriors who fought there? And Kevin Brazier, I'm going to name him because he's an author I've mentioned, he said, yes, there's one at Rourke's Drift and one at Isandalwana, which is the battle we see at the very, very beginning of the film. So no spoilers there. Yeah, Mr. Needham comments that it was a, a night action. <laughs> More people commenting, was it really Welsh? Yes or no? Uh, one chap said, I'd like the world to know that Zulu is a rubbish film. Um, so for the interest of balance, I thought I'd read that one out and someone commenting, ooh, you contrarian. <laughs> yeah. 
Mr. McCann uh, said, like all military encounters, as much to glorify as well as vilify, the best thing is to state what happened and leave political views aside. Good. Okay. And uh, and again, lots of comments about whether they might have sung Men of Harlech. Um, I'm really interested in that. It is a very traditional Welsh song, and some people are arguing that it was written afterwards. Um, the version they sing in the film, I believe, is unique to the film. There are a few different versions of this song out there, but of course, you know, writing down music is actually a relatively modern thing. When a song is invented, it's actually quite hard to to work out. Why would you write down a song? Generally, you might have the words written down, and the words, I believe, are quite odd, but when to write down a tune... Um, well, it's only when you're introducing it to someone who doesn't know it, and before the age of everyone moving around, well, why would you write it down? So often you see it's in the 19th century that we have a lot of tunes written down for the first time. Is that because there's a phenomenal, phenomenal breakthrough in music composure? Well, it's because people are moving out from the villages into cities um, and desperate not to lose you know, what, what they had known, what they'd grown up with, what their fathers had grown up with, and so on and so on. Now they're in the big city, it might get lost. And so you get people suddenly writing all this down in the Industrial Revolution, which previously hadn't been necessary. It certainly, it certainly takes a lot to write down a tune and then distribute it, um, especially before the printing press kind of improves to its current point. So you have kind of copyists um, who are very well educated and very expensive. So you don't do it a whole load of tunes. So how old is that song I think is uh, I think is something you could go on a real deep dive into and never quite come to a very satisfactory answer. I feel many of the comments I say now carry on to very similar things, whether it's the men of Harlech, whether the men are truly, truly Welsh, um, that there was a Padre Smith there not portrayed in the film, actually involved in distributing ammo during the fights and known as Ammo Smith <laughs> ever since. Um, that the Zulu Impi who attacked were unbloodied and um, they attacked so that they could take wives and the book again I'm, I'm really drawing an age in Greece because that's what I've been that's really what I've been delving into um, talks about how marriage was not marriage as we might conceive of it in the, the western world you know one man one woman uh, but it's really the ability to establish a homestead with many wives and cattle and so on it was restricting marriage was all part of restricting the growth of the Zulu empire which was a warrior empire um, quite a lot of comments saying, don't blow, the, don't throw those bleeding spears at me. Michael Caine didn't really say that. Um, apparently it comes from a series of comedy troops. Lots of people do impressions of Michael Caine. Um, and then there's, again, more and more comments over how how Welsh were they. But there's one person saying, because we've heard a lot about Hook, that officers didn't really dress like Michael Caine's character in the film. But of course, that's dramatic license you show the extremes you show you show the posh officer dressing up much more than he really would and you show one of the officers being uh, one of the soldiers being much more antagonistic than he really could have been um ooh, somebody else commented that frank Bourne was five foot ten uh, so getting a different height for him but yes anyway it, it is uh i say it's all dramatics it's all a it's all a thoroughly good film i do like this comment what what would you like people to know about battle of rock's drift and somebody just said that it happened. Um, and one gentleman, a Mr. Deziki, asked, so what is a drift? And again, it's that part of the river where you can cross. Okay, I think that's most of the comments kind of taking place. Um, an interesting one from Mr. Sheehan, uh, who said, the only casualties sustained by the British were from rifle fire. Oh, I haven't got to that bit of the book yet, but I do find that a really interesting, uh, really interesting thing about the battle. Again, a few people commented on the small size uh, of the battlefield. Uh, Kevin Brazier commenting the Zulus called it Jim's place. Yeah, Kwajimu, I do love that. Uh, that the battle of Isandawana the day before the Zulu attack on Rock's Drift was the worst day in British military history up to that point. Um, the Victoria government uh, needed a good news day and Rock's Drift was certainly it. Perhaps one, um, a few people commented, this is a very, very general comment on war films, um, that those who took part in the real battle were very, very young. Um, the actors were always in their late 20s, 30s, and a couple of them in their 40s. In reality, most of them were in their late teens, um, and that's common really across a lot of, a lot of war films. Um, 
and Mr. Stoll said, not strictly Rourke's Drift, but I do find this interesting, that the filming crew weren't allowed to pay for Zulu extras, so they were gifted the cows instead. Of course, it was filmed in 1960s apartheid South Africa. Um, and perhaps the final word to a Mr. Carter who said, all warriors, both sides. And I really like uh, the generosity of that comment, and I feel it's very much in spirit with the film. So I've gone through most of my questions, except... What's so special about the film? Lawrence James said Zulu is perhaps the most spectacular and accomplished of all imperial films. Again, partly, I feel the Welshman never yield aspect does make it special. How many movies celebrate Welsh culture? A huge part of it for me is the music. The music by John Barry, yes, of Bond soundtrack fame. Um, I was surprised to read that the film had 138 minutes. The original soundtrack is only about 20 minutes. But talk about impactful music. I feel if you watch this for the first time, and again, going off my, my Instagram, a lot of people will be watching this for the first time. This is music that will stay with you. Don't listen to it out of context. Listen to it with the movie. And uh, I, think you'll, I think you'll be as struck as I am by it. And, of course, a huge part of it was the location. They filmed the, the movie at Rourke's Drift um, it, in what was then apartheid South Africa. The Zulu King, of course, is played by the Zulu King. And... Although uh, Stanley Baker uh, was largely responsible for having the film made in the first place, it becomes really the first film with Michael Caine as a real star of it. And most, most of the DVDs available, most of the film posters you see now emphasise Michael Caine's role. Um, and of course he had served with, um, I think, the Fusiliers, you know, born of course um, 1933, Maurice Micklewaite, uh, better known as Sir Michael Caine. He began his national service with the British Army in 1952. In a year into his national service, Caine was given the option of either completing two further years standard national service or completing only one year of active, active service in Korea. And Caine chose to do the latter, set sail from Liverpool to the East Asian Theatre uh, on the Empire Halladale. He reached East Asia, and he was based at Kuri, uh, the southern Japanese mainland for training, and then as part of the 1st Battalion of Royal Fusiliers, a platoon of C Company, Kane was sent to the front line of a Korean conflict in Pusan, the 38th parallel. I'm getting some of this information from the Fusilier Museum in London. Oh, even has Michael Kane's service number 224-86574. In an interview with the Daily Mail in 1987, uh, Kane recounted some of his experiences while serving in the Korean War, and he said, There was attack after attack. You would find their bodies in groups of four, commenting on the human wave tactics employed by the enemy, which involved sending groups of soldiers sharing just a single weapon in the hope that one of them would reach the enemy and be able to fire it, perhaps in some way similar to the movie Zulu. Kane's national service was concluded by marching out of the Tower of London to the regimental march whilst wearing demobilisation clothes. Later, Michael Caine would draw on his military experiences in films such as A Hill in Korea, which tells the story of a group of British soldiers being cut off by Chinese forces. I happen to have a little look at the section Famous Fusiliers, just to see who he might have served with, and the Cray Twins. Uh, the famous gangsters were born in the same year as Kane and um, served in the same regiment. And indeed, Michael Kane uh, in interviews has confirmed that he did know them. Rather before his time, David Ben Gurion uh, served with the Fusiliers during the First World War. Of course, he fought for the British Empire in Palestine and would later become the first Prime Minister of Israel. So, so that is my shallow dive into. Zulu and the real story of Rock's Drift. Thank you to everybody who commented, responded, and has sent me to Fun Facts. If you haven't seen it, then I hope this has been enough to give a bit of background to it, a bit of the real story, but also not too much um, spoilers for the film, that you can watch it afresh and enjoy it. If you have any comments or any facts that you feel I should have covered that I didn't, please do contact me. You can find me on Instagram at Fleming Never Dies. I'm now active in this gentleman's appreciation uh, for the British Empire, a kind of history group, uh, say 27,000 people, and all very friendly and well informed. The next episode is going to be all about The Man Who Would Be King, another Michael Caine classic, which is also kind of set in the British Empire, at least the beginning is. And again, please do contact me with what should be this third instalment as I look into 
well, I was, I was starting to look into Michael Caine's season, but I've been pulled into this kind of history of the British Empire. So again, thank you so much to everyone who's contacted me. I hope you enjoyed it. And if you watch the movie Zulu, let me know. Let me know what you think. And let me know if you enjoyed it. I hope you enjoyed this podcast. Thank you very much. Goodbye.